the book you talk about several different types of players in all of this who can help to make integration better, a positive experience. Who are those players and what are some of the things that we can do? Yeah, I think that there are a whole range of different actors that have some influence on what happens in this regard. Uh, governments stand out as uh, the most obvious uh, players. Uh, and when governments stoke fear about globalization, mm -hmm. uh, which they do tend to do, uh, they're doing themselves and their citizens a great disservice. So in fact, I started writing my World 3.0 book because uh, there was a six-fold increase in rice prices back in 2007, 2008. And the then French President Sarkozy in particular railed against the speculators and said, what we have to do is shut you know, globalization down because you know, this kind of thing is just the result of too much globalization. Mm. So I went back and just looked at some simple numbers. It turns out that less than 5% of world rice production is traded internationally. It's not quite clear that reducing that 5% to 2 to 3% is going to reduce volatility. It seems much more likely to increase it. And so the people who were really cheering when Sarkozy made his comments were the commodity traders I know were saying, oh boy, more volatility. This would be great if we actually did this. So governments have a huge influence and in some sense, given how important governments are at setting the rules of the playing field, etc., at a minimum, you know, try to avoid doing counterproductive things, even if you sense that, you know, domestic popular resistance to things like immigration might not allow you to move in the right direction mm. or make further progress in the desired direction just yet. At least avoid doing things that take us backward, yeah. which uh, Sarkozy's statements about, you know, international rice prices strike me as a pretty good example of. Yeah. Second, businesses, and I've already talked about this, uh, so I won't repeat myself, but uh, businesses that are more sensitive to differences between countries are likely to make more money and also foster more goodwill or less ill will mm. than businesses that uh, don't. Uh, the uh, educational sector has a critical role to perform because uh, one of the things that we do find from our quantitative analysis is that global only tends to decline with educational levels, but that's a very rough correlation. Clearly, the content of what that education is probably also matters. And in this regard, this is one of the things that I'm most concerned about because most of the psychologists I know suggest that by the time we get students in for master's programs, it's already a little bit late in the day to be trying to shape their worldviews. So right. in some sense, we need to be pushing this not just into colleges, but into high schools. And actually, mm -hmm. I had my first high school teaching experience just out of curiosity uh, two years ago because I wondered if any of these ideas could be explained to you know, people, you know, seniors in high school, yeah. because it seems really, really important to reach people at that level of mm -hmm. development if you're trying to affect attitudinal change. I think that uh, journalists have mm -hmm. a huge responsibility. Uh, there's a tendency in journalism to depict things in black and white. Right. And some people are just uncritically for globalization and therefore lack credibility. Some people are uncritically against it mm -hmm. and therefore inveigh against the idea that it could yield anything positive. And probably the most disturbing thing to me in that regard that can be quantified is if you actually look uh, it's not just the shortfalls of our educational system. If you look at the extent of news coverage, coverage of international news on US TV, US print media, even online, same thing in the UK, it's actually decreased over the last few decades. So the journalists need to step up as well. And then finally, ultimately, it's hard to you know, imagine good things happening unless at least some individuals uh, take some personal responsibility. So there's this famous hypothesis in psycho, uh, social psychology, the all-port contact hypothesis, which is that when people have more contact with people unlike themselves, they're likely to think more favorably of them than if they have no contact whatsoever. And so I think, and this is one of the things that I tell my students, this is what I was telling my students at Stern on the first day of the MBA program, 
ultimately others can do only so much to help ease the way for globalization. Some of what has to happen is internal to people mm -hmm. and has to be managed by themselves. So ask yourself what you're going to do during your two years in the MBA program in one of the world's most, if not the most, globally connected city, not just to explore what's in New York City, but also to take advantage of all the connections that New York City has mm -hmm. with the rest of the world in order to reach a little bit farther, uh, think a little bit differently, talk to strangers, yeah. doing a range of different things. I had Anthony Appia, uh, who's a philosopher of cosmopolitanism, talk to my undergraduate students at NYU. And, you know, Anthony, um, who's thought very deeply about these issues, when asked this question, stroked his chin and said, well, try and watch at least one film with subtitles every month. <laughs> Even something I like that yeah. could make a huge difference.